Our song after our lesson will be number 911. Nine, one, one. Now with our lesson, Eli Cole. Good morning. I always get nervous when he says the song of invitation is 911. And I always wonder, am I going to have the emergency or do you have the emergency if we're going to call 911? It's good to see you. Good to be with you. Ring the message out. There's a message that the world needs to hear. It is, in fact, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It makes men free. To all the lost of every nation, ring the message out. And I guess what that song doesn't tell us is that sometimes those who are hearing the message are not necessarily will for hearers of the message. Sometimes great care has to be taken in how the message is delivered. Sometimes the message has to be delivered uh, over and over again. Sometimes we have to be subtle in how we deliver the message. Sometimes we just have to have the faith to deliver the message and be willing to accept the fact that they may not feel the same way about us after we deliver the message. The fact that it is difficult is not an excuse not to deliver the message. We will not be able to stand before the Lord our God and say that I did not give you a message, I did not ring the message out, I did not uh, attempt to make disciples because it was going to be difficult. I wouldn't want to make that argument to someone who had to endure what Christ endured. I would not want to make that argument to someone who had to die for our sins. If he was willing to do that, if he was willing to die for us, we in turn should be willing to live for him. Amen. Thank you, sister. Thank you. If you will, turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And for our reading this morning, we're going to start at verse number 18. And so we get a full idea. I would likely go all the way to verse number 30, and I may or may not preach that far today. The Bible says, Luke 18 and 18, Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, how hard is it? How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it, those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, these things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, see, we have left all and followed you. So he said, assuredly, I say to you, There is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom who shall not receive many more times in the present time and in the age to come. Eternal life. Today, we're going to talk about the danger of riches. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say this. As we look at the danger of riches, There will be two messages that come out of this lesson today. One of them is the danger of riches and the primary focus of this text. But when we look at this text in its larger context, 
I believe there's a secondary concern. And so, time permitting, I want to look at both of those things in this particular message. The primary context, the primary message, is one that jumps out at the te- from the text. And is one that we've always associated with this particular text. There's another one that's a little more subtle. And I'm going to try to get back to that one. And really, if I had my way, that's where I would spend all my time. But I don't want to overlook what the primary message of this text is. So Jesus is out teaching as he normally was. He was out amongst the people as he normally was. And he said, and, and the Bible says a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now that's a good question. That's a good question, and sometimes when, you, when you're dealing with folks, you don't always get the best questions. The questions are not always focused on the right things. But this particular question is a good question, and that is focused on the most important thing. That is eternal life. We live in a temporary situation. We are sojourners through this earth. This is a temporary life. This man doesn't ask about the temporary things at the start. He asks about eternal life. So he's asking a very good question. Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. Now, th- there's a lot that we could get into, and, and the commentators are having a good time, uh, uh, even still trying to figure out verse 19. I don't want to deal with verse 19 a whole lot other than to say that, that, that goodness comes from God. When we look at verse 20, Jesus goes on to answer the man's question. He says, you know the commandments. Now, I'm going to get back to this point later. He says, you know the commandments, which tells me that he's dealing with a religious person, and he knows he's dealing with a religious person. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. Again, we're going to come back to that. When Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. When I look at this, you have to remember, or we have to remember, that this is a man who is in front of Jesus of Nazareth. He's in front of Quite simply, the most exceptional man who's ever lived. He was, in fact, God. This is a man who has asked the right question of the right person. This is a man who, it would later be said, is sitting at the right hand of the Father. This is a man who, it would later be said, possesses all power in heaven and earth in his hand. So he's asked the right question, he's asking of the right person, yet when he gets the answer, is not what he expects to hear. Now I mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier how sometimes when you give the message, how sometimes it takes, it's, it's some difficulty, and, and sometimes people don't want to receive the message. Here's a perfect example of a person asking a question, and then they've been given an answer, and they don't like the answer. You ask me a question. Jesus, you came to me with the question. I gave you the answer, something I can speak expertly about. And the man still leaves sorrowful. Back to my original point where I started, that sometimes there is no satisfying certain people. But the problem was not with the message. The problem was not with the messenger because Jesus was in fact perfect. The problem was, in the hearer of the message, he was very rich. And because he was very rich, he didn't want to hear what Jesus had to say. He didn't want to hear that what I've got to do is give up my money. And you know, quite frankly, anybody who's got a lot of something, that's not the message you want to hear that you've got to give it up. Amen. Anything that you're good at. That's not something that you necessarily want to give up. So Jesus goes on, and this is going to be the primary message today. 
he goes on to talk about the danger of riches. And he says, it's harder, or it, it, rather, it's easier, I'm sorry, to get a man or to, to get a, cam, a, a camel through the eye of a needle than to get a rich person into the kingdom. That's amazing to me. I like language. I like language like that. You know, and I use it all the time. When, when we talk, uh, when, I, when I used to play football, uh, our coaches would say, if you were trying to say that somebody was soft and couldn't hit, you would say something like, oh, you couldn't bust a grape. You know, you couldn't bust a grape if you jumped off a refrigerator and jumped onto the grape. The grape wouldn't burst, you so soft. I love language like that. So when he says, you know what, camel through the eye of a needle, I get it. It's going to be difficult. But why is it going to be so difficult for rich folks to get into the kingdom? Well, you see a portion of it here, and it's like, you know what? Eternity is here. Eternal life is right in front of you. Jesus is giving you the key. He's telling you what you must do. And rather than pursue it, you've got something holding you back. We have an example as to why it's so difficult. What's holding him back? The fact that he has great possessions. He's got great possessions. So it's going to be very difficult. Very difficult. And what do most of us want to be? Rich. There's never going to be a time when the lotteries go out of business. Oh, there may be a time when certain states decide they don't want to do them. But people are willing to put that dollar or five dollars or ten dollars or some people put their whole checks in trying to do what? Get rich. People trying to get rich. People do all kinds of things to try to do what? Get rich. And what do your rich want to do? Get richer. The only thing better than having money is having what? More money. Amen. You understand. This is what we want to spend our time doing. But now the very thing that we're pursuing, Jesus said it's going to make it hard to get into the kingdom. So now we've got to make a decision. This life rewards riches and celebrity. Jesus is saying it's going to be hard if you get that to get into the kingdom. What are we going to pursue? Doesn't say that it's evil in and of itself, but it's going to make it difficult. If you will, as I want to get the primary point across, let's let the Apostle Paul help us a little bit. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I promise you I have a different point that I want to make, and we're going to get to it in just a minute. But I've got to deal with the primary point of the text, I believe. As we look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I don't, I don't want to read all of it, but if we go down to verse go down to verse 6 of chapter 6 the Bible says now godliness with contentment is great gain and he tells us why for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out you know contentment is a beautiful thing Contentment is a beautiful thing. Now, some people preach against or talk against contentment. You always got to be chasing something. There's nothing wrong with keeping yourself busy and involved in life. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's also something to be said for the peace that comes with contentment, with the things that you have. Because you know what? As long as you're trying to, to get that next thing, that next thing, that next, there'll always be something else to chase. And a lot of people have put off their spirituality because of that next thing. As soon as I do this, I'm going to give more of my time to God. Well, you know what? They do that, but then there's something else. And then as soon as I get this, then I'll give more time to God. He said, okay, well, I'm not chasing anything. I just want to take, take, take care of some things. I just want to pay off this bill. Well, as soon as you do that, there's another one. There's another one. There's always another distraction for someone who, who's going to be distracted. We've got to learn how to be content where we are sometimes. And he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And he tells us why. We brought nothing into this world. And it's certain that we can carry nothing out. Do 
you ever think about that? That all of the stuff that you accumulate, no matter how much you get, think of the richest person that you've ever known of in your life or in your lifetime or in the history books or anything that you can think of. And guess what? That person died and left here and left all that stuff. Now, there have been cultures that have tried to take it with them. But guess what? They've gone on to the spiritual realm and people have dug up those pyramids and gotten that stuff out of there, haven't they? They didn't get it. They didn't take it with them. They tried. They made <laughs> They buried it. They buried the service with them. Now, you know, how would you like to have that job? You're not even sick, but because your master dies, you got to go in there with him. See, I couldn't have that job. We'd be like, okay, well, Eli, we going in the, uh, in, the, in the pyramid, we're going to seal it. I'm like, okay, after you. <laughs> and when he goes, I'm going to shut the door behind him. They're going to have to catch me. Now I may die from a I may die from a heart attack running away, but I'm a, I'm not going in that. I'm not going in there. But there are people trying to take it with them, and you can't take it with you. You brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we're not going to carry anything out. Having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Now, content doesn't mean that we're not open to the possibility of having more. Doesn't mean that we're not still working. But you know what? If I've got enough to eat, I've got, a, I've got clothes to wear, you know what? Not so bad. Not, not so bad a life. But once again, he, tells us, he, he, he gives us some examples. He tells us why. But those who desire to be rich. Now, when you look at desire here, this is not just I want it. This is an unhealthy obsession with. This is almost a lust for it here. Those who, who desire to be rich, oftentimes they desire to be rich. What happens? They fall into temptation and a snare and a, and a merely foolish and harmful lust which excuse me, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Think about some of the rich folks that are just, just in our country, in the history of our country. Some people have gotten involved in organized crime. Some of the fortunes, some of that old money that people talk about had, had, was, was, was formed or was made in what? Prohibition. It was made in, in, in doing illegal type things. Fell into a snare. Did some things that, that, that put your family in jeopardy. Put yourself in jeopardy. Put your freedom in jeopardy. Why? To be rich. You desired it so much you were willing to risk it all in order to get that money. You know one thing that a, a scam artist is counting on? Greed. He's counting on greed. When you get that email and it says that I'm from the Republic of uh, Mobingo or somewhere and I, I, yes, I made that up. <laughs> And, and, and it's a, it, it's a republic of, and, and, and somebody has died and, and I need someone to pass this from this place to that place and, and are you willing to help do it and, and, and give me your number and for your trouble of just passing this to that you're going to make X amount of million dollars or X amount, uh, thousands of dollars and all I need is your account you know what they're counting on? it's far fetched but somebody's going to be greedy somebody's going to want something for nothing I have friends who, who worked in, in the federal government. You know why a lot of times people get away with stuff over and over again? Because the people who, who got caught in it and who got taken advantage of are so embarrassed that they won't turn them in because they don't want anybody to know that they were that silly, that they were that greedy, that they were that gullible. Well, what made them silly? What made them uh, gullible? The fact that they just, they just wanted something for nothing. They wanted to be rich so bad. The Bible warns us of this. You desire to be rich, you fall into a temptation of the snare. It's easy to be. It's easy to get into this snare because the devil has used money as the bait. And if you want the bait bad enough, it's like, man, that looks like 
a saber tooth tiger, but that's a lot of money. <laughs> I wonder if. No, you can't. Is it worth it? No, it's not. It's not. It's not worth it at all. And I, I grew up in hurricane country. Now, some people in hurricane country don't have the means to leave. I understand that. Some people do. And some people, when hurricanes come and hang on for the sake of their house. I'll never forget, we had a storm one time. It was hurricane, I want to say Andrew. And we were in Florida. And we took, we, we were finishing vacation. We were first married. I don't even think Alex was, you know. Yeah, this is how we were first married. Alex wasn't even born yet. And we took a flight from Tampa back out to Texas. And Andrew was hitting the other coast. And by the time we got to coastal Texas, a couple of days later, Andrew had followed us over. By this time, my grandmother was 80 years old, 80-something years old. And I, I thought, you know, the storm was coming, telling people to get out of town. I thought for sure my grandma, because at that point she had lost her sight. She couldn't move very well at all. You know, she had diabetes real bad. She couldn't get around. And I thought for sure we were going to have a devil of a time getting her out of that house. Because, you know, most of the people want to stay with their house. Man, we started talking about the, the, the storm and leaving. She was like, well, y'all come by and pick me up. <laughs> you know, she was the first one to say, I'm ready to go. This is just stuff. This is just stuff. My life is more important than what? This stuff. But a lot of people have made the opposite decision. The stuff is more important than their lives and the lives of their loved ones. For the love of money is the root of all evil. It's the cause. Don't let anybody tell you that it's money. Money is inanimate. It's not, the problem is not in the money. The problem is in us. The problem is in what we'll do to get the money. The problem is not in the money. The Bible does not say money is the root of all evil. It does not say that. For the love of money, the desire, what you're willing to do for it, is the root of all evil. All kinds of evil. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. There are people, just like this ruler that we talked about, he was willing to walk away from Jesus because of his possessions. And don't you, don't you believe that people don't walk away from Jesus right now because of their possessions? Don't you believe there are people who don't walk away from Jesus right now because of the stuff they have or the stuff they want to get? That still happens. They walk away from the faith in their greediness and pierce themselves with many sorrows. You know, people ask the question all the time, what's wrong with the famous people? You know, when Whitney Houston just died, and I love me some Whitney Houston. That was that one of my favorite singers of all time. And, and, and the same thing happened with Michael Jackson. And even when I was a kid, the same thing happened with Elvis Presley and, and all that kind of stuff. And people say, what is it? But you know, we chase stardom. And we chase money. And do we ever look and see, you know, that some of the folks who have it aren't happy with it and ain't doing so well with it? Amen. Some of the people who get it might have wished they didn't have it. Michael Jackson used to make his kids dress up in, in masks so they wouldn't have to deal with being recognized with him. The idea was, if you go out in a mask with me, you can go out without me, without the mask, and people won't know who you are. He wanted his kids to have... Not the celebrity life that he had. They wanted him. He wanted his kids to have a regular life, and all. And, and a lot of people are chasing the celebrity life. What's wrong with the famous people? The root of the, root of, the love of money, rather, is the root of all kinds of evil. There's a lot of stuff you get yourself into chasing money. Let me go back. To Luke chapter 18. Because I want to get into the secondary message of this text. As I see it. And for years I missed this. For years I didn't think about that. 
about this message. A certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. All these things I've kept from my youth. We're dealing with a religious person. We're dealing with a person who ain't so, who ain't so bad. If you, if you look at the message we did a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we looked at the Pharisee and the tax collector. And it's also right here, in, right here in Luke chapter 18, going back to verse 9. You remember, Pharisee, tax collector, going to pray. A lot of the Bible is dealing with the lost in the world and trying to draw them in. But a lot of the Bible is written to and about those who already have a relationship with God. Uh, those who already are following and pursuing God. It's about, a lot of times, religious people. Go through and read the New Testament and you'll find that a lot of it is written. You've got the Gospels, which are the accounts of Jesus' life. But then you have all these letters to these different churches. Romans, Ephesians, Church of uh, Colossae, uh, 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 Thessalonica. So you have all these letters. So different than you have the uh, uh, the pastoral epistles there, Timothy and Titus, etc. So a lot of it is written to people that already have a relationship with God. And the religious person earlier in the chapter was one who trusted in himself, despised others, went in to pray, and didn't get his prayer through because he looked down on the center. And because he, he tried to approach God face to face as if he could stand on equal footing with God. Well, in, in this particular text, as we've moved on, here's a guy who has kept the law. He's kept it. Jesus doesn't say, no, you didn't. Jesus doesn't say, you're a hypocrite, you're a bad dude. He doesn't say that. He doesn't even really deal with it. This guy says, uh, 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 Jesus, I'm sorry, says, don't commit murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness. Jesus just goes right on to the next thing. We deal, and even if he wasn't perfect, perfect, he was pretty good. But there was something in his life. Even though he was pretty good, there was something in his life that he kept separate from his faith. And that was his money. There was something in his life, as good as he was, that he kept compartmentalized. And so, I want us to look at that right now. I want, I want to ask you, and it's rhetorical. I don't mean I don't want you to, to, to blurt out your uh, your down card. I don't want you to blurt out your weak spot. Your weak spot. But what is it in your life? Because I'm gonna, I'm going to assume that most of the people here are pretty good. Most of the people here have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Most of us here are trying to do the right thing. Most of us here have probably kept most of the law, kept most of the commandments. Probably not too many violations in our lives. But if we tried to stand in front of Jesus, we couldn't stand in front of him perfect. We couldn't stand in front of him blameless. There's some things in our life that we probably need to change. So now, what is it that Jesus could turn around and ask us. If I'm standing before him and say, well, Lord, you know, because you know how we do that. We, we do it with our parents. We do it on our job. You, 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 you come and you try to make your case. You state your case. I don't, I don't steal. I don't lie. Don't curse much anymore. Don't, oh, I don't curse. I'm joking. <laughs> don't drink much anymore I don't drink, I'm kidding again <laughs> but we make these cases but what are we holding back? what is it that I still struggle with? it's something and everybody in here might have a different answer to that question but don't look at the rich young ruler and say, ah, oh, yeah, he, you know, he, he he loved his money. You love something too. Don't look at the, at the rich young ruler and say, well, he walked away from Jesus. He allowed his money to make him walk away from. You make some, you allow something to make you walk away from Jesus too all the time. 
We all struggle with something. What is it in your life that you know you need to let go of? What is it about yourself? And if you don't have anything, you're probably fooling yourself. And you need to let go of that. Or you're being dishonest with yourself. And you need to let go of that. Because I want to tell you something. We've all got something that we need to let go of. Something we've got to grab hold to. None of us are standing in here. When, 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 when we reach judgment, all of us standing in here are going to be counting on our measure of grace. There's not going to be a single one of us standing in here, sitting in here, that stand before God and get to say, that's all right, Lord, I, I got it covered. <laughs> no, no one about mine, use it on the next guy. Not a single one, if, if you think that, you're in trouble. I don't care how good you are. There's something that will stand between you and perfection. Now, the challenge today is not to let that thing or those things cause you to walk away from God like the rich young ruler did. Acknowledge that is there. Maybe he wasn't aware. Maybe he really thought he was a good guy. Maybe he really thought because of the people he was around, he was a good guy. Maybe he thought that he had done everything he was supposed to do. Maybe what Jesus told him was a shock. I don't know. So let me get you over the shock right now. If you have the same conversation with Jesus, there's something in your life he could point to. Don't even be shocked about it. Don't be fooled about it. Now, the question is, what are you going to do? What are you going to do now? I'm going to close. There was, and you never forget this once I tell you, because I've had people over the last 12 years who approach me and see me on the street in Georgia, Texas, and they say this to me as soon as they see me. There was, there was, Alex was a little kid, maybe it wasn't 12 years, but it was, it was, Alex was little. He's 19 now. He must have been seven or eight. He's playing football. He, he got on one of those teams that was a juggernaut. I mean, they never lost. And they were like that before he got on the team. He played that one year. They were like that before he left. He was not a star player. He's not here, so I can tell you. Alex, when he, that first year he played football, eight years old. So he cried every night at practice, every day at the game. He did not like Now, he plays college football now, so I can tell this story. He's very good. He was all state in Maryland last year. Very good player. But back then, not so much. We would go to the games. And the community was such that everybody knew this team was a juggernaut. Everybody knew, and everybody pulled against us. Everybody pulled against the Milford Warriors. And so you would, you would, you would go to the game, and, and they would, and, and if the other team would get up on us, the, the, the folks from the other side would start taunting us. You know, I read the other day where a parent jumped on a coach and stuff. Those people are real. That happens, okay? And you get out to the park, and you start drinking, and, and all that kind of, and people start talking, and, and they would always say this. They would get a good play, and they would look over, what are you going to do now? And they get another play. What are you going to do now? And I, it was this one guy. And I, I'm, I'm from the South myself, so I can tell this. And he had his brown paper bag. And there was something in it. And he would taste a little bit. He, what are you going to do now? That was his thing. And he would walk all around the field every time that they would get a play. What are you going to do now? And of course, we would answer the call. And we might, man, it might be, they score that first touchdown, it'd be 40 to 7 at halftime. I mean, just kill them. And of course, we would, I, I was younger then, and I, and I, and I, would, I was not above teasing back. So every time we would score, 
our parents, and I was right in the middle of them, we would go back, what are you going to do now? And, that, and that's what we would do. And so my point in telling you all this, now that you know you're not perfect, what are you going to do now? Are you going to walk away from Jesus? Or are you going to work on adding to your faith? Are you going to work on trying to be Perfect as the Bible uses perfect. Not perfect meaning sinless, but perfect meaning complete and mature. What are you going to do now? Are you going to quit? Are you going to play? Are you going to get in denial and say, well, you know what? I, I, I'm pretty good. As the rest of God's just going to have to cover the rest. This is just how I am. That's rebellion. This is just how I've always been. Lord, just going to have to accept me as I am. Song even says, just as I am. Well, that's how you started, but you're supposed to repent. You're not supposed to be like that the whole time you're a Christian. I better quit because I can start on another run right now. If you're here today, you're not a Christian. You can do so. If you're not a Christian... You've got to stand before God like this rich young ruler did without a way to cover your sins. And you've got some. So what are you going to do now? If you're going to become a Christian, you've heard a portion of the word, you need to believe it with all your heart. You need to be willing to yield to it. You've heard it, you believe it, but now are you willing to yield to it? This is the doing part of faith. Something, there is something for us to do. And what we have to do is yield to it. We've got to repent. We've got to change our direction. Yeah, I've heard and believed it, but I've got to change my direction. Jesus didn't tell this guy just to have a mental uh, assent, just, just to agree with me. He said, sell all you got. He demanded action from that guy. A change in his life. There's got to be some changes. You just can't say, oh, yesterday I didn't believe, today I do believe, and I'm still going to be the same God. No, ma'am, and no, sir. There's got to be some changes. So if you're here today and you're willing to make some changes, you're willing to confess Christ and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins, what you can do now is become a Christian. He'll add you to his church. When you stand before that great throne of judgment, you don't have to stand alone. That's a beautiful thing. Jesus Christ as the advocate. As your advocate. He's won more cases. He's going to win all his cases. Not even F. Lee Bailey could say that. If you're here today and you're already a Christian, maybe you, 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 you're kind of like this guy. You keep most of the law most of the time. You do the things that's in the Bible most of the time. Don't fool yourself. You still have a ways to go. If you've got something in your life that you need to confess, confess it. If you need to turn, let go of some things, pick up some things. Be willing to do that. If there's some things that are too heavy for you, we'll pray with you, we'll pray for you. Your effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. If you're here today and subject to the call, let it be known now. Together we stand the same. The song of encouragement.